On January 16, 1943, the SS Skanktady rested silently at dock in Portland, Oregon. She was a brand new Liberty ship, barely ten weeks from the Kaiser shipyards, untouched by storms or enemy fire. The morning was calm, the water flat. Then, without warning, a sharp crack echoed across the harbor. In an instant, the vessel split in two, her hull fractured from deck to keel as if cut by an unseen blade. Sailors scrambled in panic as the bow and stern sagged apart, the ship breaking while safely tied to the pier. The Skanktady wasn't alone. That same winter, the SS John P. Gaines disintegrated in calm waters, and the T-2 tanker SS Manhattan cracked so severely her crew abandoned ship. Between 1943 and 1944, more than 2,500 Liberty ships suffered structural failures, deck fractures, holes, catastrophic splits. At least 19 broke entirely in two, and three vanished at sea so fast they never sent a distress signal. These weren't battle losses, they were disasters of engineering. The Liberty Ship Program was America's high-stakes gamble. After Pearl Harbor, the nation needed cargo vessels at unprecedented speed. Traditional shipbuilding required eight months per vessel. The Maritime Commission couldn't wait. Enter Henry Kaiser, an industrialist with no prior shipbuilding experience, who promised a radical solution. Mass-produced freighters built like automobiles rolling off an assembly line in weeks, not months. Kaiser's Richmond, California shipyards used revolutionary methods, welding instead of riveting, prefabricated sections instead of piece-by-piece -piece construction, and assembly line logistics borrowed from Detroit's car factories. By late 1942, Liberty ships were launching in an average of 42 days. Propaganda celebrated the industrial miracle, showing welders transforming steel plates into ocean-going ships at impossible speeds. The SS Robert E. Perry even set a record. Built in just four days and 15 hours, it was a symbol of American ingenuity. Then the cracks appeared not from torpedoes, not from storms, but spontaneously catastrophically in conditions that should have been routine. Engineers were baffled. The steel met specifications. Welds seemed solid. Designs came from proven British blueprints. Yet ships were splitting like fragile porcelain. Cracks often began at sharp corners, hatch openings, or gun mounts. Once started, they raced through welded hulls in seconds. Investigations began. Metallurgists examined failed steel under microscopes. Engineers reviewed stress calculations, naval inspectors measured every crack. Theories abounded, poor steel, shoddy welding, flawed design. But ships continued breaking, sailors fearful of the decks beneath their feet. The answer emerged from an unexpected source, Bessie Hamall, a night shift welder at Richmond Yard No. 3. One of thousands of women filling shipyard roles, she noticed what engineers missed. She observed how welders tackled massive steel plates starting at edges or running long continuous seams. As each weld cooled, the metal contracted, warping plates and locking residual stress into the structure. Her foreman dismissed her concerns. She wasn't an engineer, but she persisted. In November 1943, Hemmel presented her findings, complete with test plates welded using alternate sequences. Some plates warped and stressed. Others, welded from the center outward, lay flat. Supervisors observed production and confirmed her observations. The standard sequence was forcing steel to carry dangerous stresses, especially at sharp corners and hatch openings. When these stress ships hit cold North Atlantic waters, the steel became brittle, making catastrophic fracture inevitable. Hamill's solution was straightforward, weld from the center outward. Distribute heat and stress evenly, avoid long continuous seams, and alternate weld locations to prevent localized stress buildup. These practical insights revolutionized shipbuilding, though Hamill had no formal engineering training, just an intimate understanding of how steel behaves under a torch. By December 1943, her insights reached Henry Kaiser. Implementing her recommendations required halting production temporarily, Retraining welders and redesigning the assembly process? Testing validated her theory. Sections built with Hamill's sequence showed dramatically lower residual stresses, while steel and welds remained chemically identical. The physics of brittle fracture, residual stress, and cold-induced brittleness finally explained the Liberty ship's failures. 
Steel is dynamic. Welding introduces localized heat, expanding and contracting the metal. If residual stresses concentrate at sharp corners in cold water, cracks can accelerate faster than the speed of sound in steel, running unimpeded through welded plates. Traditional riveted ships avoided this problem because rivets act as natural crack stoppers. The square designs of Liberty ships specified by British architects for cargo efficiency unintentionally amplified stress points. Recognizing the solution's significance, Kaiser acted. In January 1944, production at Richmond Yard 2 paused as the Victory Ship program began. Unlike Liberty ships, these vessels were redesigned with rounded corners, optimized hatch openings, redistributed frames, and improved steel alloys for low temperature toughness. Welders were retrained in sequencing, thermal management, and stress relief techniques. Prefabricated modules were built in controlled conditions, welded from the center outward, and stress relieved before final assembly. Critics scoffed when Victory ships took longer to build than Liberty ships, but construction speed became secondary to reliability. By April 1944, Richmond Yard II had transformed into a highly coordinated factory. Steel sections arrived pre-cut, curved bow modules performed, frame assemblies pre-welded. Welders followed strict sequence cards. Stress relief ovens dissipated residual tension and supervisors enforced consistency. The result, vessels capable of withstanding the harsh Atlantic without catastrophic fractures, a triumph of industrial precision and human observation. The Liberty ship failures, once a maritime nightmare, became the blueprint for the next generation of cargo vessels an extraordinary story of ingenuity, observation, and the unsung heroics of a welder who refused to accept the unacceptable.